introduction to the science history of the universe volume four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by larry wilson the science history of the universe volume four edited by francis wolt wheeler chemistry introduction technically it is difficult almost impossible to draw sharp distinctions between the various subdivisions of natural science omitting consideration of mathematics which constitutes a necessary and convenient mode of numbering diagrammatization and quantitative interpretation of natural as well as of other phenomena a clear and concise language the fundamental sciences are physics and chemistry within the last half century the borderland of these two has become so elastic in its boundaries that there has developed again an original science so closely involving the characteristics of the two fundamental ones that it is called physical chemistry with a clear understanding of the foregoing there should be no misinterpretation of what follows in this introduction or failure to appreciate what has been set forth within the covers of this book by its author chemistry took its origin out of knowledge of small mysteries even today many may reasonably look with wonder at the accomplishments of the chemist who seems to be a master at massive as well as at a diminutive ledger domain unfortunately at times it is assumed that he knows more than he does and some as in the charlatan days pretend to be wiser than they are the history of chemistry for the past two centuries has been the history of the progress of civilization its careful student will draw from it values that are cultural material and moral its educational value depends upon the accuracy it gives one's powers of observation training in the correlation of the facts observed tracing the underlying laws thus brought out and the stimulation of the imagination to bring other facts apparently not in conformity with the laws into harmony with them or to so alter the explanations secured as to include the seeming exceptions thus theories propounded as logical sequence which as shinstone has said are as searchlights which cast light into dark places and enable us to see sometimes plainly sometimes only in dim outline much that would remain hidden if we were denied their aid are scrapped like so much old metal when their usefulness ends so the history of chemistry like the history of inventions definable as a method for utilizing a discovery often reads like a romance the material value of chemistry has had to do with our wealth health and happiness chemistry by the utilization of much of the wastes of the world has produced great wealth as is seen in the numerous dyes synthetic medicines etc which have been made from coal tar it has also saved injurious wastes at some of the great copper smelters today where the sulphur gases were formerly turned loose into the air to the destruction of forests they are now converted into the cheap but valuable oil of vitriol upon the use of which there is scarcely anything we eat drink or wear that is not directly or indirectly dependent in fact one may judge the financial progress of a nation by the annual production or consumption or both of this acid the industries of nations have been changed through the influences of applied chemistry the old matter fields of france are now vineyards the matter dye alizarin being made by german processes in a factory so the millions of acres formerly given to the cultivation of the indigo plant may help feed england when they are cultivated for food products as the germans now manufacture a higher grade of indigo at lower price than was formerly attainable commercially from the natural sources even with the poverty wages paid in india through the application of the principles of chemistry better products have been produced at cheaper prices and thus made available for more people substances possessing little or no practical use rare curiosities for the chemical museum have become of great actual value this may be seen in the development of incandescent gas lighting we have only recently come to an awakened conscience of fuel the quantity of fuel required to produce the energy for an industrial process 
is dependent upon the manner in which it is required to do its work once smoke was regarded as an evil then a nuisance now it is known as a waste and none has better cause to wage war against it than he who produces it a smoking chimney is a thief not only because it projects visible unburned carbon into the atmosphere but in nine cases out of ten on account of the invisible gases which are hot and combustible regenerated gas heating not only prevents smoke but is a powerful means of economizing heat it has been estimated that the saving of national wealth effected by its universal application would amount to a sum sufficient to pay the aggregate national debts of all the civilized nations what a horn of plenty may be seen outlined in the dense smoke hanging like a pall over some of our cities in this country the problem of energy usually expressed in terms of fuel is a most serious one to every nation upon the invention of the steam engine the days of the windmill and old-time water wheel seemed to be numbered sailing ships gave way to mechanically driven vessels gas explosion engines and electric power applied to motor vehicles are driving out the horse without whose aid at one time it was thought that no civilized nation could exist and have given us a propelling force with which the air is navigated in some ways there is a disposition to revert in part to the old order of things as shown in the utilization of water power with improved appliances inventors are not without hope of utilizing the ocean tides in fact several installations where this is done do exist the indefinite hope of some imaginative people that we may secure some unknown source of energy however is at present an undependable and gratuitous assumption therefore it is of the utmost importance that the strictest economy be practiced in the expenditure of our fuel capital the conversion of the force of gravity into electrical energy by means of falling water has given an enormous impetus to progress in applied chemistry not only has it made the production of new and useful substances possible as carborundum and artificial graphite but it has cheapened the production of other materials as caustics bleach copper aluminum etc in money values that involve large figures and promises to render available bodies of metallic ores formerly regarded worthless cable news tells us of the renewal of the german potash syndicate which controls the natural deposits of potash salts at Stassfurt and lays heavy tribute upon every farmer who uses mixed fertilizers electrical energy may yet give relief from such a tax upon every civilized person in the world for laboratory experiments have shown the possibility of utilizing the abundant insoluble hence unavailable source of potash a necessary element for plant growth which exists in every soil but in comparatively small yet sufficiently large amounts perhaps the most important practical forward steps taken in applied chemistry in recent years have been along the line of the utilization of atmospheric nitrogen no living thing plant or animal is known which does not contain nitrogen nitrogen is therefore necessary it is the most expensive yet abundant and easily wasted element of plant food the air contains three thousand nine hundred billion tons of this element but it is not available except to a limited degree as a food it must be properly combined with other elements for plants to feed upon it this has recently been accomplished commercially and its importance is realized when attention is drawn to the known sources of nitrates and the fact is recognized that the visible supply will not suffice for the life of two generations at the normal rate of increase both in population and productivity of the soil fortunately the processes devised in this day of wonderful surprises do not participate in the destruction of valuable coal deposits in obtaining the energy but use white coal which with the constant aid of nature through the principles of evaporation and condensation may be used over and over again to this end it has stimulated the efforts of many toward the conservation of the forests for upon these depend a constant supply of water and the avoidance of devastating freshets which destroy the power plants the solution of problems of preventative medicine that is sanitation the development of aseptic surgery the discovery of anesthesia 
have been contributions of chemistry to human happiness the chemist has sought and is seeking the establishment of uniform grades and international standards and agreed methods for determining them for products of exchange those familiar only with the secular press accounts of the struggles for pure food and drink and distinctive labels therefore realize what this means to accomplish the refinements of this improvement in communal and international morals however will require a recasting of the meaning of many words in every language this cannot fail to promote in measure the development of a desirable universal language for all nations while the history of chemical economics is one of fascinating interest it must not be forgotten that these allotments to the benefits of the living are in the end dependent upon pure chemistry in most cases they have resulted from the application of principles derived from facts which presented no utilitarian aspect in themselves and the principles too appeared to have only the remotest connection with utility it is not intended to imply that applied chemistry has been or is entirely dependent upon pure chemistry for there are numerous instances where what knowledge we possess in the speculative and real field of the science has received its initial impulse from some useful application the progress of the science has often been with halting step three important misconceptions namely the immaterial nature of gases the inverted notion of combustion and the material nature of heat had first to be removed before the idea that matter is composed not only of molecules but of atoms could gain acceptance in the beginning of the nineteenth century by the atomic conception of dalton eighteen o three different kinds of matter are dependent not only upon different kinds of molecules but different kinds of atoms in molecules and furthermore as later proved even the configuration of the atoms within the molecules various energy demonstrations as heat electricity and light bring about various changes in these molecules to produce different kinds of matter we know carbon dioxide and water under conditions which obtain in the leaf of a tree under the influence of light combined with the elimination of oxygen and the production of sugar the chemist as an expert achievement can produce sugar in his laboratory but so far he has little understanding of the chemical action of light in the laboratory of the leaf although photochemistry promises soon to yield results which may not be devoid of startling interest we do not know how nature does many things that we are accustomed to see around us and attribute to a so-called vital force in exercising the utmost care to avoid confusing the accomplished with the projected the thesis may be reverently supported that life is energy or a manifestation thereof one were devoid of judgment did he not let it be clearly understood that he appreciates the objections such as retention of form through years reproduction of species and atavistic inheritance of character that may be raised with reason in opposition to the mechanical physical chemical or energy explanation of life as yet we do not know the constitution of the highly complicated structure of the carbon hydrogen oxygen nitrogen and sulphur compounds of the nucleus chemical matter as neurleister says the same could have been truly said of the sugars before fisher's masterly work beginning about a generation ago or osborne's more recent work upon the nucleus of wheat can we say having learned the structure and synthesized the nucleus that we shall not be able in the laboratory to give it that impulse which launches it upon a career of reproduction our militant egoism need not be shocked by apparently nourishing a youth sublime with the fairy tales of science we thought we knew the air but within the last two decades it has been learned that the atmosphere contains one per cent of an element never dreamed of namely argon we thought that every chemical atom was characterized by a distinct ability to combine with other atoms to form compounds argon and four other similar elements including helium since found are devoid of this characteristic the nineteenth century gave us crookes tubes which made the discovery of rntgen rays possible and gave the hint that established the existence 
of the becquerel rays the pursuit of which eventuated in the unmasking of radium by the curies this remarkable substance carries enormous charges of readily detectable energy and under certain conditions changes into another element helium ramsey and saudi the transmutation of the elements has been experimentally demonstrated in such considerations confusion of terms must be studiously avoided philosophically radium cannot be an element because its molecule breaks up into something other than an atom of the same thing yet it has a recognized place in the table of elements this latter fact is due to an agreement among chemists to recognize a substance as an element which under proper conditions exhibits a spectrum showing characteristic lines possessed by no other element and possesses a definite combining weight radium satisfies these two requirements and constitutes an exception to the general proposition of consistency of atoms in an elementary molecule if we retain the term element and there is no indication of its being discarded soon its definition must be broadened a philosophic idea has come forward at intervals ever since the days when we have written records of men's thoughts namely that there is or was one of the simplest substance of which all matter is or was made if that be true and perhaps it is then we only require the knowledge of how to change one element into another and the necessary apparatus to make the idea an accomplished fact so far however we have observed only the disintegration of the elements and we must yet build them up a knowledge of the cathode rays produced within a crook's tube gave j j thompson and rutherford experimental data for the latest interpretations of the phenomena of radioactivity and the most modern answer to the question of what is matter thirty years ago crookes suggested the existence of an ultra gaseous state of matter a protyle of which all matter is composed and that its particle weighs about one thousandth that of a hydrogen atom the lightest atom known thompson following an elaborate procedure weighed these particles and found that the value was between eight hundred and one thousand as they bear electric charges he designated them electrons rutherford has shown that in the disintegration of radium a gas called emanation is produced this in turn changes through several steps and continuously into helium the change consists in hurling particles called alpha particles at a terrific speed from the emanation these particles are atoms of helium plus an electron which is lost in time by weighing before and after the weight of the electron is determined these values coincide with those obtained by thompson etymologically an atom means something which cannot be divided we have been accustomed to apply the term to the chemical individual which has not yet been divided as soon as it is shown to be complex the particle ceases to be an atom as language changes there can be little objection if it is done by common agreement so there may be no misunderstanding to applying the term electron to a real atom or the real indivisible particle for undoubtedly the atom of dalton is complex therefore matter is composed of molecules molecules are made up of atoms atoms consist of electrons electrons are charges of electricity but what is electricity ostwald asserts that we are aware of matter only through the evidences of energy matter is an assemblage of energy systems there is no matter all resolves itself into the mechanics of energy heat electricity and life are elementary energy systems having definite capacity and intensity and as chemical entities with their equivalents represent our atomic conceptions but here we go into the realm of metaphysics many of the secrets of nature have been gained laboriously wrought for but rich rewards await the coming generations who inherit a knowledge of the extremities of our globe but must yet learn of its interior science may therefore be looked upon as a gem beautifully cut with its many facets we view the light from one face or more with the play of colors more exquisite to the eye and gratifying to the senses 
whence the light that is nature the throbbing pulsation of which controlled by some all great hence all wise providence makes our universe what it is however little or much of it we may or may not comprehend charles baskerville end of introduction section one of the science history of the universe volume four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the science history of the universe volume four edited by francis rolt wheeler chemistry chapter one development of the chemical conception to many intelligent and cultivated persons not specifically instructed in chemistry this word recalls confused memories of colored liquids glistening crystals dazzling flames suffocating fumes intolerable odors startling explosions and a chaos of mystifying experiments the interest in which is proportional to the danger supposed to attend their exhibition further reminiscences are of many singular objects in wood metal glass and earthenware of retorts and condensers furnaces and crucibles together with bottles innumerable filled with solids liquids and gases this whole bewildering paraphernalia moreover is connected by glass tubes of eccentric curves displayed in inextricable confusion and meaningless array behind this chaos arise vague memories of a professor or teacher discoursing learnedly in a polysyllabic jargon and attempting to explain the unusual phenomena in words which seemed stranger than the experiments themselves it is rarely forgotten as h c bolton suggests how potent was the fascination exerted upon the hearer a feeling of awe and mystery as though the mind were approaching the border of the supernatural impressions that have clung to chemistry ever since its entanglement with the superstitions of alchemy astrology and the black art men and women interested in modern thought who undertake to gain through chemical literature a knowledge of what chemists are doing in and for the world encounter a discouraging nomenclature which repels them by its apparent intricacy and cumbrousness their opinion of the terminology of an exact science is not enhanced when they learn that black lead contains no lead copperas no copper mosaic gold no gold and german silver no silver that carbolic acid is not an acid oil of vitriol is not an oil that some sugars and some kinds of wax are alcohols that cream of tartar has nothing in common with cream milk of lime with milk butter of antimony with butter sugar of lead with sugar nor liver of sulphur with the animal organ from which it was named readers of chemical writings sometimes fail to appreciate the advantages of styling borax dimetaborate of sodium or of calling common alcohol methyl hydrate and they ignore the euphony in such words as pentamethyl diamidothiodiphenylamine diiodomethylate a substance baptized by dr albert masson those whose chemical education consisted in attendance on a course of lectures illustrated by experiments performed in their presence interspersed with occasional recitations from a prosaic textbook which taxed the memory in true chinese fashion may be pardoned for retaining very hazy impressions of the true character of the science on the other hand many thinking and reading persons recognize the magnitude of the scope and operations of chemistry and have some appreciation of its benefits to mankind it is not to be unexpected however that the layman's conception of chemistry in the abstract the cold exact abstruse science seems as far removed from the realms of romance as the higher mathematics yet mathematics and music are strangely correlated and so it is not to be wondered at 
that the chemist himself the enthusiastic master of mysteries finds in his modern miracle making that proportion of romanticism necessary perhaps to the mental well-being of the individual the widely varying ideas which have prevailed at different periods in the history of chemical science with regard to its nature and object are significantly portrayed in the definitions of chemistry which have obtained at these periods and an examination of the following collection of definitions will reveal a curious growth old proverb alchimia est ars cujus initium laborare medium mentiri fini mendicare alchemy is an art the beginning of which is to work the middle to lie the end to beg according to bolton suidas a greek lexicographer of the eleventh century chemistry the artificial preparation of silver and gold paracelsus fifteen thirty seven chemistry is the art of resolving bodies denis la chair fifteen forty chemistry alchemy is that part of natural philosophy which teaches the preparation of metals on the earth by imitating the operations of nature in the earth as closely as possible van helmont 1620 chemistry is the art of analyzing bodies by fire a chemical dictionary london 1650 chimia is the art of separating pure from impure and of making essences salmon sixteen seventy two chemistry is an art or a practical science which teaches the methods of resolving compound bodies into their natural principles and by this means rendering them most pure and most efficacious as a medicine either for curing diseases or for perfecting the imperfect metals bibliothèque des philosophes chimiques paris sixteen seventy two lemery sixteen seventy five chemistry is the art which teaches the methods of separating the different substances contained in a compound cours de chimie paris sixteen seventy five boerhaave seventeen twenty four chemistry is an art whereby sensible bodies contained in vessels or at least capable of being contained therein and rendered sensible are so changed by means of certain instruments and especially fire that their several powers and virtues are thereby discovered with a view to the uses of medicine natural philosophy and other arts and occasion of life elementa chemie seventeen twenty four pernetti seventeen fifty eight common chemistry chimie vulgaire is the art of destroying the compounds which nature has made hermetic chemistry is the art of assisting nature to perfect them fables egyptiennes et greeks paris seventeen sixty six pernete seventeen eighty seven alchemy is a science and the art of making a fermenting powder which serves as a universal remedy for all the diseases of men animals and plants dictionnaire mytho hermetique paris seventeen eighty seven false alchemy cannot better be defined than the act of making one's self miserable both as regards fortune and health nicholson seventeen ninety five chemistry as a science teaches the methods of estimating and accounting for the changes produced in bodies by motions of their parts amongst each other which are too minute to affect the senses individually and as an art it consists in the application of bodies to each other in such situations as are best calculated to produce those changes dictionary of chemistry london 1795 h davy eighteen o two chemistry is that part of natural philosophy which relates to those intimate actions of bodies upon each other by which their appearances are altered and their individuality destroyed 
Lectures in Collected Works, Volume 2, 1839. Thompson, 1810. The object of chemistry is to ascertain the ingredients of which bodies are composed, to examine the compounds formed by the combination of those ingredients, and to investigate the nature of the power which occasions these combinations. System of Chemistry, 1819. Franklin, 1866. Chemistry is the science which treats of the atomic composition of bodies and of those changes in matter which result from an alteration in the relative position of atoms. Lecture Notes for Students, London, 1866. Rodwell, 1873. Chemistry is the science which treats of the various kinds of matter, whether simple or compound, their properties, and the laws which govern their combination with and separation from each other. Birth of Chemistry, London, 1873. Roscoe, 1873. The science of chemistry has for its aim the experimental examination of the properties of the elements and their compounds, and the investigation of the laws which regulate their combination one with another. Ostwald, 1890. Chemistry is the science which treats of the different forms of matter, their properties, and the changes which they undergo. Mendeleev, 1891. Chemistry is concerned with the study of the homogeneous substances or material of which all the objects of the universe are made up, with the transformations of these substances into each other, and with the phenomena which accompany such transformations. Remsen, 1892. The science of chemistry has to deal with everything connected with the deepest seated changes in composition which the different forms of matter undergo. At the present time, chemistry is usually defined as the study of matter and the changes produced in it by the action of chemical force or other forms of energy upon it. It rests upon a secure basis of fact, and its first object consists in learning the constituents of which the material world is composed, in reducing these constituents to their simplest forms, and in building up new chemical compounds from the latter. These problems, along with the task of determining the laws governing the chemical combination of matter, occupy the time and thought of the chemists of the present day. The Egyptians, Hebrews, Phoenicians, and other ancients acquired a certain indefinite knowledge of chemical processes in a purely accidental manner, which were applied for the practical results obtainable, but no explanation of these processes was deduced. Neither did the Greeks and Romans make any attempts to collate facts then known or to pursue the investigation of natural phenomena for the attainment of a definite purpose, nor, before the fourth century of the present era, were endeavors made to gain an insight into chemical processes by experiment. Such a lack of data did not prevent the peoples of antiquity from speculating on the nature of matter, however, and their views upon the ultimate constituents or elements of the organized world have given the first age of chemistry a characterizing feature. Although there is no positive evidence that the Greeks and Romans were acquainted with a belief in the production of precious metals from base metals, yet the theory that one element can be transformed into another was developed from the ancient doctrines of the nature of the elements, and at the beginning of the present era, primarily in Egypt, attempts were made to transform the base metals into gold and silver. The art of transmutation was termed chemia, a word which is probably derived from the North Egyptian name for Egypt, von Meyer. This term is mentioned by Plutarch as the name of Egypt, but there is some diversity among etymologists whether the present word chemistry is derived from this Egyptian word, the Arabic kema, meaning secreting, the Sanskrit kema, meaning gold, or the Greek chemos, meaning fluid. 
alchemy which is derived from the arabic al kimija an agent for effecting transmutation had for its object the solution of the problem of transmutation the attainment of the so-called philosopher's stone by the aid of which metals were to be transmuted and the life of man prolonged this task characterized the age of alchemy a period extending for at least twelve centuries this age was one of magic and necromancy but effected the extension of the knowledge of chemical facts the next period in the history of chemistry is known as the iatrochemical or the period of medical mysticism this period extended from the first half of the sixteenth century to the middle of the seventeenth century and was characterized by the absorption of medicine by chemistry however chemistry did not lose its alchemistic tendencies and was not yet an independent branch of natural science after the iatrochemical period occurred a transition period and chemistry became a science this period is known as the period of the phlogiston theory owing to the fact that the chemists at the end of the seventeenth and during most of the eighteenth century attempted to explain the phenomena of combustion by assuming the existence of a hypothetical principle of combustibility phlogiston the early part of the most recent period in the history of chemistry is characterized by the decline and fall of the phlogiston theory and its replacement by the anti-phlogistic chemistry of lavoisier which laid the foundation of the new chemistry a science which covers the era of quantitative investigation this era has had for its guiding star the chemical atomic theory and the immense strides made in the science during the latest epoch are due to the exact study of chemical composition and the close investigation of physico-chemical relations end of section one recording by linda johnson section two of the science history of the universe volume four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the science history of the universe volume four edited by francis rolt wheeler chemistry chapter two the chemical knowledge of the ancients in endeavoring to find traces of a science in the earliest historic times the mind must be free of the idea that the ancient presentment will be similar to the modern form as it is known today the ancients possessed a knowledge of isolated scientific facts and occasionally formulated crude theories but it is exaggeration to speak of systematic science as existing among them this was due to the fact that they preferred to advance from the general to the particular instead of drawing general conclusions from accurately observed facts since they were disinclined toward experiment and over fond of speculation the position of the natural sciences in the early times particularly that of chemistry is sufficient to show the manner in which errors were introduced and became firmly established as a result of following the purely deductive method which aristotle deemed the road that should lead to the desired goal venable very appropriately speaks of the birth of chemistry in terms analogous to the development of the ovum which will lead through a series of metamorphoses up to the perfected insect and rodwell compares the study of the transformations occurring at various periods in the development of chemistry with the study of the history of a nation certainly there occurred the primary groping after causes struggles to frame laws and revolutions and it is informing to follow the progress of chemistry much as may be traced the history of a people's growth the beginnings of chemistry are lost in the haze of the remote past and unquestionably date back thousands of years to the time when the pressing needs of man taught him to adapt to his own ends the means and materials placed at his disposal it is interesting to note 
that woman was the first to receive instruction in chemical lore according to tradition and legend in the apocryphal book enoch originally written about one fifteen to one twenty b c an account is given of the relations existing between angels and terrestrial folk and it is stated that one of these angels azazel taught women the making of jewelry and the use of rouge as well as imparting not a little information concerning the metals and precious stones of the earth this legend also is met with in writings of the third and fourth centuries and even in those times chemistry was held to have been imparted to mankind in a remote past the question of the ultimate constituents of bodies or the elements occupied the minds of the oldest nations and the primary conceptions of these elements occurred in the mythical times before empedocles and aristotle the word element is derived from the greek word elephas which was changed by circumstances to elebas elemas and then to elementum the latin equivalent in babylonia it was believed that what was in the heavens was also in the land and in all portions of it and the babylonians considered that a relation existed between the heavenly bodies and colors they soon observed that certain relations existed between terrestrial phenomena and the deportment of the heavenly bodies and this observation led them to suppose that the first conceived elements fire water air and earth were controlled by preternatural powers as might be expected from the similarity in their efforts in accounting for the origin and formation of the universe the egyptian conception of the elements was similar to the babylonian the oldest writings of india teach that the world was made of wind water earth fire and a substance of immaterial nature ether in the laws of menu the subtle ether is spoken of as being the first created and from this by transmutation came air and this through some change became light or fire and by a further change in this came water from which lastly earth is deposited this theory was accepted by the brahmins and buddhists and found its way into europe in the anguttara nikaja consciousness is named as a sixth element and in the writings of kapila the leading exponent of the samkhya philosophy it is stated that there are five subtle particles rudiments or atoms perceptible to beings of a superior order but unapprehended by the grosser senses of mankind derived from the conscious principle and themselves productive of the five grosser elements earth water fire air and space kanada who founded the nyaya system of philosophy proposed an atomic theory in which he states that atoms are eternal and that the ultimate atom is simple one of the oldest of the chinese classics the shu king contains a document of still greater antiquity termed the great plan with its nine divisions the first division of which speaks of water fire wood metal and earth as the elementary substances which went to build up the universe this document probably depicts a belief five thousand years old and it is known that the above-mentioned substances were regarded as elements in the dynasty of huang ti twenty six ninety eight to twenty five ninety nine b c in that most obscure chinese classic the yi king fire and water wind and thunder the ocean and the mountains appear to be recognized as the elements the most complete theories of the ultimate constituents of bodies have come down from the greeks although it is highly probable that the greek philosophers did not themselves deduce their theories of atoms and elements but derived them from other sources some have maintained that the pythagorean theories are derived from the philosophy of the chinese but since the greeks came from asia as did the other indo-germanic races it is natural to suppose that they brought various eastern theories with them 
modified them according to their environment and developed them by their own powers the earliest greek cosmogonists were those of the ionic school which was founded by thales of miletus who lived about six hundred b c thales considered that water was the material cause of all things and was ignorant of the atmosphere or air such views as well as those of anaximenes and heraclitus in the sixth century b c who ascribed to air and fire respectively the role of ground material have had no influence upon the development of chemical knowledge leucippus who lived in the fifth century b c and who is regarded as the founder of the atomistic school considered that all things consisted of spaces and atoms the latter being further indivisible having only quantitative differences between one another and being always in motion this theory was further developed by democritus of abdera who took a primal element as the basis of his speculations but subdivided this further in that he imagined it to be made up of atoms which differed from one another in form and size but not in the nature of their substance according to him all the changes in the world consisted in the separation and recombination of these atoms empedocles of agrigent five hundred b c regarded the elements air water earth and fire as the basis of the world and maintained the constancy of matter he did not speak of the derivation of the elements from a single substratum or of ultimate atoms and in his system the contending forces cause the combination and separation of the elements the system of natural philosophy of plato four twenty seven to three forty four b c has been practically without influence on the development of physical science plato assumed the existence of the four elements of empedocles and propounded mathematical doctrines concerning these elements but disregarded certain difficulties pointed out by subsequent philosophers his pupil aristotle three eighty four to three twenty two b c however among the most famous of the greek philosophers is deemed the sage who exercised the most influence upon subsequent thought aristotle considered that four elements were insufficient in themselves to explain the phenomena of nature he therefore assumed a fifth one which he imagined to have an ethereal nature and to permeate the universe the followers of the aristotelian doctrine in the middle ages supposed this element to be material the quinta essentia and made many endeavors to isolate it causing endless confusion the stagorite considered the properties of bodies to be the result of the simultaneous occurrence and intermingling of fundamental conditions and regarded the component elements only in the sense of bearers of these fundamental properties he held that the chief qualities of the elements were those apparent to the touch as warm cold dry and moist and maintained that each of the elements of empedocles is characterized by the possession of two of these fundamental properties air being warm and moist water moist and cold earth cold and dry and fire dry and warm he concluded therefore that the differences in the material world were to be attributed to the properties inherent in matter and that the elements can change one into another in aristotle's opinion the transmutation of the elements happens owing to the abstraction of certain qualities and the substitution of others hence he concluded that an element can more readily change into one with which it has one quality in common as cold water to cold earth and hot fire to hot air than into one completely its opposite as hot dry fire to cold wet water aristotle regarded the change of water into steam as a transmutation of the elements a qualitative change of material 
as otherwise he could not explain the great change of bulk if the steam had previously existed in the water without change or difference views of this nature on the states of the aggregation of matter led to the idea of transforming one kind of matter into another and the generalization of the aristotelian ideas fostered the belief in the possibility of the transmutation of metals a particular feature of the alchemistic period it is unnecessary to point out how widely the above-mentioned views with regard to the elements deviate from the conceptions of modern chemistry yet the greek philosophers with the freedom and boldness of the hellenic mind and an ability to infer and enunciate had grasped the idea of elemental substances elements out of which all things were made the principles of things and had thought out the existence of atoms as the ultimate constituents of matter the belief in the existence of the hindu an aristotelian element ether was and still is assumed as a necessity for explaining many phenomena various chemical facts had been learned by empirical methods and by accident but the greeks overvalued the deductive and undervalued the inductive method and held aloof from the observation and practice of chemical processes in the earliest records of the egyptians jews and hindus there is to be found an acquaintance with the working of different metals which art was held by the younger of those nations to have been taught by mythical personages on reference to the drawings found on the tombs in egypt figures are shown therein illustrating the art of metallurgy and it has been learned that the operations were conducted by weighed portions of matter moreover biblical history records that the jews were acquainted with gold silver copper iron and probably lead and tin and that a form of balance was used for weighing metal the greeks and romans were familiar with many metallurgical processes but made no attempts to explain the chemical processes involved in the smelting of ores the ancients believed that the metals were produced by the penetration of air into the vitals of the earth and assumed that the amount of metal increased as the mine proceeded inward this conception was based on the testimony of aristotle and was entertained for a long time gold and silver were the metals earliest known and were valued highly in the early times the gold mines of nubia were worked by the egyptians and in the time of rameses the second these mines yielded gold to the value of six hundred million dollars per annum the phoenicians obtained gold in eastern africa and were the first to mine gold on the island of thasos the malleability of gold rendered it possible for the ancients to gild objects by covering them with thin sheets of the metal and they later learned to produce a layer of gold on objects by dissolving the metal in mercury and heating the amalgam produced the older nations were acquainted with processes for freeing gold from admixtures as there are extant records of purifying gold dust by melting it with lead and salt for some time a method practiced at a very early period and referred to in various parts of scripture pliny describes the purification of gold by means of mercury and the process used in his time was similar to the amalgamation process practiced at the present day in general it may be stated that the old and new methods of obtaining gold differ in details not in principle silver was supplied to the ancients by the phoenicians who worked the rio tinto mines in spain the native silver mines of laurium and the mines in armenia according to posidonius silver was discovered in spain by the forests taking fire and melting some of the ore in which the precious metal was embedded strabo states that silver was purified by fusion with lead but it does not appear that the separation of silver from gold was known before the present era 
Beckman states that the ancients used an alloy of gold and silver, afterward termed electrum, because they were unacquainted with the art of separating these metals, and it is known that an amalgam of gold and silver was regarded in ancient times as an individual metal, being termed asm by the Egyptians. Copper has been known from the earliest times, and some authorities consider that it was the next metal after gold which man learned to extract and reduce. The present state of archaeological research does not suffice to locate all the principal copper mines of the ancients, nor to compute the quantity of metal which they yielded, but it is believed that both the Hindus and Chinese made coins of this metal at a period which may be fixed approximately at about three thousand years ago copper was one of the greatest articles of commerce with the phoenicians who derived a large supply from the mines of nubia which at one time supplied the whole of the western world they combined with it the tin obtained from the islands of cyprus and britain to make the bronze of commerce which was early used for making weapons ornaments and utensils and the ancient civilized nations were acquainted with bronze before they had learned to prepare tin in a metallic state palmer states that it is evident that the copper mines in the neighborhood of serabit el khadim and magara in egypt were in full working order at the time of the exodus and bowerman is authority for the statement that the period over which the working of the copper mines at wadi magara extends according to hieroglyphic evidence is from the third to the thirteenth manathonian dynasties with regard to the smelting processes by which the aeus or copper of the ancients was obtained nothing certain has as yet been ascertained the concurrent testimonies of hindu assyrian babylonian and greek tradition as well as its own etymology fix the discovery of iron that is to say the invention of smelting iron ore and of manufacturing iron and steel or the escape of the invention from the temples at a period not earlier than the fifteenth century b c among others brahma krishna ninias jason and Osiris were credited with the invention of iron. Lepsius is authority for the statement that iron has been in use in Egypt for more than 5,000 years, and it is well known that the Egyptians early learnt to temper iron, which they employed for the manufacture of a variety of hard instruments. Kirchmeyer, a writer of the 17th century, hazarded the conjecture that adam was the first to use iron for economic purposes to which opinion there are no satisfactory objections based on evidence the ancients prepared iron from brown iron ore and magnetite in smelting furnaces but no particulars are vouchsafed as to the actual process used however old roman iron smelting furnaces have recently been unearthed near Eisenberg in the faults, and the form of furnace used by the Egyptians may be judged from various inscriptions. Lead was used by the Romans for making water pipes, writing tables, and coins, and soldering with lead, or with an alloy of lead and tin, was also well known. The Romans worked the lead ore deposits of Britain, but little is known with regard to the smelting processes used tin was prepared quite pure in olden times and was used in the preparation of two important alloys solder and bronze the phoenicians obtained tin either from india or britain and the israelites procured some from the midianites among the romans lead and tin were distinguished from one another as plumbum nigrum and plumbum candidum Stanum, the present latin word for tin signified an alloy of tin and lead brass an alloy of zinc and copper was first described by aristotle and was long regarded as copper which had been colored yellow by fusing it with cadmia 
an ore of zinc often mentioned in ancient writings as having been found in cyprus but was not recognized as an alloy to a much later date and zinc as an individual metal was not known to the ancients the name cadmia is said to have been derived from cadmus who is reputed to have introduced the making of brass at thebes but this is doubtless incorrect cadmia was also used as a medicine as early as 300 bc when the metal mercury or quicksilver was first discovered is not known but its preparation from cinnabar by means of copper and vinegar is mentioned by theophrastus about 300 bc and it was known at least as early as aristotle's time some writers consider that in the passage in the bible where moses directs that all the metals taken from the amalekites should be made to pass through the fire and afterward to be purified by the water of separation that this water of separation was mercury but this is not based on fact dioscorides describes the production of mercury from cinnabar and iron and pliny refers to the purification of mercury by forcing it through leather the ancients were aware of the fact that mercury attracts particles of gold and unites with them and vitruvius describes the manner of recovering gold from cloth in which it has been woven by this means the principal ore of mercury cinnabar mercuric sulphide would not fail to attract the attention of the crudest folk by its brilliant red color and there are sufficient evidences to show that it was used as a pigment or paint by the romans ethiopians and jews glass the transparent solid formed by the fusion of siliceous and alkaline matter was known to the phoenicians and constituted for a long time an important manufacture of that people because of its ingredients natron sand and fuel abounding upon their coasts the art of making glass however originated in china and egypt and its discovery in the last mentioned country was accidental soda having been added as a flux to sand containing gold for the purpose of extracting the latter glass ornaments have been discovered in egyptian tombs which are as old as the days of moses and pliny and strabo give accounts of the famous glass works of sidon and alexandria the greeks acquired the art of glass making in the fifth century b c and the romans used glass for windows mirrors and various other purposes rawlinson states that transparent glass was brought into use or at least the oldest specimen found is in the reign of sargon the second seven ten b c the artificial coloring of glass by metallic oxides was discovered at a very early date and remains have been found in ancient egypt which indicate that methods for producing enamels and artificial gems were known ancient profane authors make mention of immense emeralds which are considered now to have been made of glass and pliny states that beryl opal sapphire amethyst etc could be imitated but that these imitations were softer and lighter than the real gems the art of engraving on glass was also known in ancient times and the ancient assyrians cut gems with great skill the art of pottery presents a more ancient and closer alliance between art and utility than any other branch of manufacture and the date at which this art began to show itself is lost in the darkness of remote antiquity the old egyptians understood how to coat their earthen vessels with colored enamel and porcelain was discovered and employed by the chinese at an early date the potter's wheel is probably the most ancient mechanical appliance which industrial art has invented the people of ancient times prepared soap by the action of alkalis on fats and drew a distinction between soft and hard soaps according as potash or soda was used in the manufacture according to pliny the soap in germany and gaul was prepared from animal fat 
and a water extract of plant ashes strengthened by adding lime the art of dying no doubt originated in that love of distinction inherent in the human mind inducing man for its gratification to stain his dress or his skin with the gaudy colors of the vegetable kingdom and was practiced very long before any views were entertained as to the nature of the changes which occurred in the chemical processes involved the egyptians developed dyeing with some degree of scientific precision as they were acquainted with the use of mordants learning that alum imparted no color itself but fixed certain dyes on cloth and perfected the dyeing of purple tyre made dyeing one of its principal occupations and it has been asserted that the invention of the celebrated dye tyrian purple was made in that city the discovery of this purple dye is said to have been made fifteen hundred years before the christian era and pliny states that the juice for communicating it was obtained from two different kinds of shellfish kermes indigo madder archel safflower alkanet henna broom galls walnut pomegranate seeds egyptian acacia and litmus were used as coloring matter in the ancient times in pliny's time white lead cinnabar vermilion smalt verdigris hematite soot and indigo blue were used for painting and ink was prepared by mixing soot with gum galena sulphide of lead and realgar and orpiment sulphides of arsenic were used for pigments and medicines notwithstanding the fact that their poisonous action was known the egyptians were the first to use chemical preparations for medicinal purposes verdigris white lead litharge alum soda and nitre were employed in making medicaments and lead plasters were made from litharge and oil iron rust was a very old medicine and homer speaks of sulphur being burnt to expel the evil spirits from a home it was also used for purifying clothes conserving wine and for destroying foul odors among other substances whose application dates from a very early period may be mentioned lime which was burnt and used in making mortar and for causticizing soda for soap making soda and potash which were used in washing glass making and soap making bitumen and asphalt which were employed for cements torches and embalming and acetic acid in the form of crude wine vinegar which the ancient assumed as being present in all acid plant juices and considered to be a powerful solvent among the other organic compounds known at the beginning of the christian era and possibly before then were sugar starch petroleum oil of turpentine and various fatty and ethereal oils sugar was obtained from the sugar cane starch from wheat and the fatty oils olive almond and castor oils were pressed from seeds and fruits oil of turpentine was prepared by distilling pine resin the ancients were familiar with beer wine and bread making but did not with their disinclination toward observation know that alcohol and a gas different from air carbonic acid are formed during such processes of fermentation end of section two recording by linda johnson Section 3 of the Science History of the Universe, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 4, edited by Francis Ralt Wheeler. Chemistry, Chapter 3 The Early Alchemists. 
the origin of alchemy undoubtedly is to be sought for in remote antiquity as mythical tradition reveals the sources from which the belief in the transmutation of metals was nourished and the primary historical sources are rare and obscure however it appears that alchemy was pursued as a secret science held in honor among the egyptians chaldeans and other nations the almost universal tradition among alchemists is that their art was first cultivated among the egyptians and when it is recalled that ancient egypt was a country where the chemical art was widely practiced it is not surprising that the earliest records of alchemy are to be found there clement of alexandria states that the knowledge of the art was confined to the priests who were prohibited to communicate it to any but the heir apparent to the throne and to such among the priestly caste as were virtuous and wise and plutarch mentions that the strictest secrecy was observed it would seem that the art of alchemy was especially cultivated at memphis and Tomer, the high priest of memphis was so great an adept that he was said to be familiar with all things the first dominant personality with which the origin of alchemy is associated is that of hermes trismegistus and the alchemists acknowledge him as one of the earliest masters if not the originator of their creed and craft this hermes some assert is identical with canaan the son of ham and the name is synonymous with the old egyptian godhead thoth which when endowed with the serpent staff as the symbol of wisdom was compared by the grecians with their hermes hermes trismegistus was said to be the author of twenty thousand or more books which probably indicates that as the god of letters all books were dedicated to him and in roman egypt pillars were erected in his honor upon which alchemistic inscriptions were put in the form of hieroglyphs in the eleventh century the alchemist hortulanus announced the latin version of an essay which he ascribed to hermes this came to be known as the smaragdine table or tabula smaragdina and it is probably one of the earliest of the hermetic philosophical or alchemistic writings an english translation of this essay made by f g weichmann in his chemistry its evolution and achievements is as follows true it is without a lie sure and most true what is below is like that which is above and what is above is like that which is below of one substance to perform miracles and as all things have come from one being the mediation of one so all things have been generated from this one thing by adoption its father is the sun its mother is the moon the wind has carried it in its womb its nurse is the earth the father of every talisman of the whole world is this its power is unimpaired when it is turned upon the earth separate the earth from the fire the subtle from the material gently with great cleverness it rises from the earth to heaven and again descends upon earth and receives the force of those above and those below thus thou wilt have the glory of the whole world all obscurity therefore will leave thee this is of all strength the strong strength because it will subdue every subtle thing and penetrate every solid thus has the world been created hence there will be wonderful adoptions whose measure is this therefore i have been called hermes trismegistos possessing three parts of the philosophy of the whole world what i have said of the operation of the sun has been fulfilled this essay is obscure enough to receive almost any interpretation the chaldeans who were masters of occult sciences undertook the fusion of astrology and magic and the belief in the connection between the sun and the planets and the metals which was assumed for a long period was of babylonian origin it was believed that the planets influenced the growth of the metals and the signs of the heavenly bodies became the symbols of the metals in fact the metals were called by the names of the stars up to the end of the eighteenth century one writer of the fifth century a d states that gold corresponds to the sun silver to the moon lead to saturn tin to mercury iron to mars and copper to venus in the thirteenth century symbols were used freely to denote some of the metals 
as for example gold soul was represented by a circle with a dot in its center silver luna was depicted by a crescent and copper venus was denoted by the symbol used by glauber at a later date many of the alchemists saw in these symbols an indication of the metals they represented thus the circle illustrated perfection of the metallic condition while the semicircle indicated only an approximation to this state some have supposed that the symbol for copper venus represented a hand mirror and this is highly probable the jews who were believers in magic played an important part in the fusion of eastern and western doctrine at the time of the birth of christianity and some writings on alchemy have been ascribed to jewish writers the later alchemists record various biblical characters as alchemists on the authority of the bible as adam tubal cain moses and his sister miriam and john and referred the origin of alchemy to the time before the flood democritus 406 to 357 bc is the earliest historical personage connected with alchemy but it is not known how much of the alchemical knowledge of the ancients should be assigned to him his name is found in the magic ritual of the laden papyrus found in thebes in the third century a d and according to pliny he received instruction in magic from ostanes the mede during the first centuries of the present era the transmutation of copper into gold was thought to be an ascertained fact and the works of pliny dioscorides zosimus aeneas gazeos and themostus euphrates furnish records of this belief which probably originated in the production of alloys possessing the color of gold or silver cop has pointed out that it is probable in early times a plating of gold or silver may have been considered an actual transmutation of the covered object in the early part of the christian era alchemy attained much notoriety and was fostered by the church in fact the records of alchemy go on increasing from this era and the savants of the time have left us fragments of their works first among the alchemists of the early part of the christian era is zosimus who lived in the third century in his manipulations comprising twenty-eight books he speaks of the fixation of mercury of a universal medicine and of a tincture which possessed the property of converting silver to gold zosimus is spoken of with great esteem by the later alchemists and his mystical language exercised a pronounced influence on the alexandrians and medieval alchemists synesius bishop of ptolemais wrote commentaries on the works of zosimus he lived in the fourth century olympiodorus a native of thebes reproduced the philosophy of thales and anaximenes and was the first to distinguish matter according to its combustibility his works however do not contain any certain information with regard to definite operations until the fourth century alexandria had been the centre of science and philosophy but under roman rule it gradually declined so that at this time only the temple of serapis was left this temple which was the bulwark of medical and alchemical study however was destroyed in the reign of theodosius so that many books which would have been invaluable for the history of chemistry were lost through its destruction the serapium of memphis and the temple of ta also were destroyed at the same time as the temple of serapis and it is only due to the relations which before then were developed between the egyptians and the byzantine empire that all acquaintance with chemistry was not obliterated notwithstanding these catastrophes the knowledge of some chemical operations continued to exist in egypt even though the light of science was gone and adepts no longer taught their cult and the conviction that the base metals could be transmuted into gold and silver with its alluring possibilities still remained a feature of egyptian thought at the period when ignorance and barbarism prevailed through every part of the roman empire greek learning found an asylum among the saracens about the middle of the eighth century the second prince of the abyssinian dynasty the caliph al-mansur founded the city of baghdad and the light of philosophy dawned upon arabia al-mansur studied astronomy under the direction of two christian physicians at his court 
and offered liberal rewards to those who would undertake the translation of the greek works on philosophy and science which work was executed by the christians then resident in baghdad he also founded a university at baghdad and pupils and professors flocked to it from all parts greece persia and india were taxed to help the arab mind india especially providing many alchemical notions the succeeding caliphs harun al rashid and al mamun also were liberal patrons of learning of every kind and under the caliphate of the latter the light of philosophy shone forth in meridian splendor science continued to enjoy the protection of the saracen princes even after the empire was divided into several caliphates and was by means of their conquests disseminated throughout the greater part of the world from the beginning of the ninth to the end of the thirteenth century when the power of the saracens yielded to that of the turks schools of learning flourished in the empire and the college at baghdad contained six thousand masters and scholars at the beginning of the twelfth century about the year one thousand twenty schools were instituted at cairo and learning was imparted to a multitude of pupils academies were also founded in africa and spain and these were distinguished by eminent philosophers when barbarism universally prevailed among the western christians the library of the university of cordova contained two hundred and eighty thousand volumes and it is said that this university produced one hundred and fifty authors although islamism prohibited magic and all arts of divination alchemy applied to the preparation of medicines was ardently studied and it found its way to the other western nations where from the arabian universities in spain it attained its full development in the thirteenth century the first of the alchemical adepts who appeared during the christian era was the so-called founder of experimental chemistry abu musa jafar al sofi afterward known to the western nations by the name of gerber this alchemist is supposed to have lived in the eighth century but his life is involved in hopeless obscurity and he has sometimes been confused with discabir of tharsis however some historians of chemistry have ranked him first among the chemists and alchemists who flourished prior to the time of van helmont and it has been remarked that gerber is to the history of chemistry what hippocrates is to the history of medicine no less than five hundred treatises have been attributed to gerber and these were supposed to have included all the physical sciences but the recent researches of bertolat and others have proved that the latin writings hitherto ascribed to gerber could not have been written by him the oldest of these writings the summe perfectionis magisteri in sue nature libriquatur was not written till the middle of the fourteenth century and it appears that the de investigatione perfectionis metallorum which was formerly thought to contain two important literary productions of gerber his testament and a tract on the construction of furnaces belongs to an even later date bertolat further has shown that the arabic manuscripts of the authentic gerber prove that he did not really profess the remarkable knowledge attributed to him but that he adhered to the greco-alexandrian alchemists his real views were mystical for instance he believed in the influence of the planets upon metals and his reasoning was mostly from premises which now appear defective the latin treatises with which until the investigations of bertolat the name gerber has been connected contain views on sulphur and arsenic and on the transmutation of metals in fact they would make it seem that the object of his work had been the discovery of the philosopher's stone but it is now known that these writings contain the collected knowledge of the four or five centuries after the time of gerber Rezis, whose true name was mohammed ebdim sakarja abu bekr arazi was a celebrated disciple of gerber he was born about the year eight fifty and no less than two hundred and twenty six treatises are said to have been written by him these writings discuss the influence of the stars on the formation of metallic substances beneath the earth and contain some assert the first mention of borax orpiment 
realgar and certain combinations of sulphur iron and copper as well as some salts of mercury and compounds of arsenic figure he believed in the transmutation of metals and undertook to perform a transmutation before emir al masur prince of khorasan after the latter had spared no expense in providing the necessary apparatus and materials for the accomplishment of the magnum opus he failed miserably however and subsequently died in poverty and obscurity the next great arabian scientist was the illustrious ebn sina generally called abyssina who was born about nine eighty he is believed to have died in the year ten thirty six although several oriental peoples assert that he is still alive and enjoying the nectar of perpetual life and untold wealth results of the supercharged power of the philosopher's stone six or seven treatises on alchemy have been ascribed to avicenna one of these the tractatulus alchemiae treats of the nature of mercury which avicenna regarded as the universal vivific spirit capable of penetrating developing and fermenting avicenna undoubtedly derived his chemical knowledge from gerber according to weight he describes several varieties of saltpetre and treats of the properties of common salt sulphur orpiment vitriol and sal ammoniac among the other disciples of gerber may be mentioned the arabian physicians aben zoar averhoes maslima and abu Kasis, and the philosopher al farabi aben zoar who lived in the eleventh century is said to have made some additions to the knowledge of medicinal preparations while averhoes a physician celebrated for his personal virtues attempted to improve the theory of medicine by the aid of philosophy and attained some prominence as a chemist a north persian physician abu mansur wrote a work on the principles of pharmacology by which may be ascertained the chemical knowledge of the time but it appears that the arabian alchemists of the eleventh twelfth and thirteenth centuries mostly devoted themselves to attempts at transmuting the base metals into gold these alchemists in the main were of little prominence and contributed nothing new at the beginning of the seventh century almost the whole western world was overwhelmed with intellectual darkness and in the eighth century philosophy and learning seemed ready to expire among the greek christians however the spirit of barbarism which possessed many of the reigning emperors was not characteristic of the reigns of michael bardas and constantine porphyrogenites all of whom excited by the example of the saracen caliphs recalled and encouraged learning constantine was himself in the ninth century the pupil of the byzantine scholar michael Sallus, who contributed to the propagation of alchemistic ideas from the eleventh to the fifteenth century philosophy and learning were much neglected in the greek empire but at the time when constantinople was taken fourteen fifty one there were several learned philosophers among the greek christians these were obliged to leave their monasteries however and this circumstance occasioned the return of grecian learning into europe for after the greek empire was destroyed by the turks the friends of literature and science fled into italy taking with them many of the egypto-greek and arabian alchemistic doctrines notwithstanding the fact that the decadence of saracen power in europe was rapid after the expulsion of the arabs from spain yet for some centuries the influence of arabic thought was great the works of the arabians were translated and widely disseminated and the modes of their thought and work imitated then too the returned crusaders aided in the spread of eastern learning and many industries were founded by them they were particularly interested in alchemy however and as the nobles were impoverished and desired to replenish their treasuries attempts at transmuting the base metals into gold became more than a craze it became the cardinal point toward which all chemical knowledge was directed many christian princes were imposed upon by pretending possessors of the philosopher's stone it is especially interesting to note that the first appearance of an alchemist at a german court was about the year 1063 when a baptized jew announced to adalbert von bremen that he had acquired in greece the knowledge of transmuting copper into gold 
it was during the thirteenth century that learned men gave their attention to the study of alchemy and consequently the art reached a high degree of development these scholars considered that the transmutation of the metals was a settled fact and maintained the existence of the philosopher's stone and some of them albertus magnus thomas aquinas roger bacon arnold villanovanus and raymundus lullius greatly influenced the development of chemistry by their pursuit of alchemy in the scientific spirit albertus magnus eleven ninety three to twelve eighty was a scholastic theologian but his genius and curiosity did not allow him to pass by the hermetic science without giving it attention in fact he was the first german chemist of prominence and is ranked as a skillful practical chemist for the period in which he flourished he became a dominican friar in twelve twenty one and from this time he was an instructor in philosophy grammar alchemy and natural history at cologne paris hildesheim and regensburg michael meyer a later writer on alchemy states that albert acquired the secret of the philosopher's stone from the disciples of saint dominic and that he communicated it in turn to thomas aquinas meyer further declares that for thirty years albert employed his knowledge as an alchemist and astrologer to construct from metals selected under proper planetary influences an automaton having the power of speech this was the curious android which was said to reply to every question proposed to it and which thomas aquinas destroyed under the impression that it was a diabolical machine albert is also said to have suddenly reproduced the flowers and softness of spring in the midst of winter for the entertainment of william the second king of the romans when the latter dined in the monastic house at cologne the views of albert are in the main those of the arabian school although he added many new chemical facts he mentions alum caustic alkali red lead arsenic green vitriol iron pyrites and liver of sulphur he knew that arsenic renders copper white and was familiar with the method of purifying the precious metals by lead he found that sulphur attacks all the metals then known except gold and designated the cause of this combination by the term affinitas in his de rebus metallicis et mineralibus albert states that he tested some gold and silver said to have been manufactured by an alchemist and which resisted seven fusions but that the pretended metal was reduced to a scoria by an eighth fusion he distinctly recognized the possibility of transmutation however when the operations were performed on the principles of nature and considered that all metals are composed of an unctuous and subtle humidity incorporated with a subtle and perfect matter that is the metals are all essentially identical differing only in form in one portion of his de alchemia he asserts that gold is produced by the action of pure sulphur on pure mercury by the permanent action of nature and after more or less time thomas aquinas twelve twenty five to twelve seventy four the universal and the angelic doctor was a dominican friar and disciple of albertus magnus and taught at paris and naples several works on alchemy have been ascribed to him in one of these the thesaurus alchemiae he states that the aim of the alchemist is to change imperfect metal into that which is perfect and moreover asserts that such a transmutation is possible the other works of this character attributed to him are secreta alchemiae magnalia and de esse et essentiae mineralium he wrote on the manufacture of artificial gems and some of the terms still in use by modern chemists occur in the supposititious writings of aquinas as for example the term amalgam for alloys containing mercury roger bacon twelve fourteen to twelve ninety four the wonderful doctor was born at ilchester in somersetshire england and studied at oxford and paris it is said that he studied history learned the oriental and western languages and gained a knowledge of jurisprudence and medicine subjects to which little attention was given in his time and in order to prosecute his studies without interruption he assumed the monastic life in the order of st francis 
he employed his time not in the controversies of the day but in researches into the properties of natural bodies and by the aid of mathematical training and experiment he acquired a knowledge of mechanics statics and optics his success in physics and in the construction of automata kindled a spirit of envy among the monks of his fraternity and this led to the circulation of a report that he held converse with evil spirits causing him to be imprisoned for ten years he also knew how to use convex lenses for telescopic and microscopic purposes and drew attention to the error which occasioned the gregorian reformation in the calendar bacon was familiar with many processes in chemistry and doubtless would have produced great discoveries in this science had he not been drawn aside from the path of true investigation by the philosophical ignis fatuus which led the philosophers of this age to attempts at transmutation he believed in the philosopher's stone and his views on the transmutation of metals may be illustrated by the following quotation from his speculum secretorum to wish to transmute one kind into the other as to make silver out of lead or gold out of copper is as absurd as to pretend to create anything out of nothing the true alchemists never held such a pretense what is the real problem the problem is first by means of art to remove from the rough earthy mineral a bright metallic substance like lead tin or copper but this is only the first step toward perfection and the chemist's work must not stop there for besides that he must look for some means of getting the other metals which are always present in the bowels of the earth in an adulterated condition for example the most perfect is gold which one always finds in the native state gold is perfect because in it nature finished her work it is necessary then to imitate nature but here a grave difficulty presents itself nature does not count the cycles which she takes for her work to which the term of life of a man is but as an hour it is then important to find some means which will permit one to do in a little time that which nature does in a very much longer time it is this means which the alchemists call indifferently the elixir the philosopher's stone etc bacon also stated with the help of aristotle's secret of secrets experimental science has manufactured not only gold of twenty-four degrees but of thirty forty and onward according to pleasure the application of the study of alchemy to the extension of life was another subject of study with roger bacon and he states that the operation by which the base metals are purged from the corrupt elements which they contain till they are exalted into gold and silver is considered by every adept to be calculated to eliminate corrupt particles of the human body so that the life of mortality may be extended for several centuries the chemical investigations of bacon have proved valuable but the above-mentioned alchemistic ideas seem incomprehensible to moderns when contrasted with his other views and knowledge gunpowder-like mixtures were within his knowledge and according to some named sulphur and saltpetre as two constituents while the third constituent he denominates under the anagram luru mone cap ubre he probably derived this knowledge from some arabic source the arabs were acquainted with gunpowder-like mixtures as early as twelve eighty and the knowledge of the propelling force of such mixtures came about between thirteen thirteen and thirteen twenty five gutmann states that the so-called ancient records concerning the invention of gunpowder should be approached with great caution since manuscripts of doubtful date and origin have been inadequately translated to serve various nations as proofs of their claim to this invention bacon found that saltpetre could be purified by solution in water and crystallization he subjected organic substances to dry distillation and observed inflammable vapors were produced and he called attention to the fact that air was necessary for the burning of a lamp all these facts together with many others roger bacon learned by experiment and he is to be regarded as the intellectual originator of experimental research his important works are as follows opus meus de secretis operibus artis et naturae redix mundi speculum secretorum secretum secretorum 
breviarum de dono dei and alchemia maiorum the alchemistic tendencies of the thirteenth century are distinctly reflected in the work of the two celebrated adepts arnaldus villanovanus arnold de villanova and raymundus lullius yet much uncertainty exists in regard to the life of the latter and to the works ascribed to him nevertheless both exercised no small influence on their generation and they were held in high esteem on account of their methods and labors arnaldus villanovanus twelve forty five to thirteen ten whose birthplace is uncertain studied medicine at paris for twenty years after which he travelled through italy visiting the various universities he subsequently went to spain and practised as a physician in barcelona but learning that peter d'apono a friend had been seized by the inquisition he withdrew to sicily where he wrote his tracts on medicine under the patronage of frederick the second king of naples and sicily arnaldus was however charged with magical practices and in thirteen seventeen the inquisition of tarragona condemned his books to be burned on account of the heretical sentiments they expressed he was an adherent of the arabian school believing in the composite nature of the elements and in the transmutation of the metals and his skill in the hermetic philosophy was recognized by his contemporaries one of whom wrote in this time appeared arnold de villanova a great theologian a skilful physician and wise alchemist who made gold which he submitted to all proofs arnaldus believed that quicksilver was the medicine of all the metals that sulphur was the cause of their imperfections and that the philosopher's stone existed in all bodies he was acquainted with oil of rosemary and oil of turpentine and conducted distillations in a glazed earthen vessel with a glass top he was probably the first to point out the poisonous nature of decaying flesh he made external application of various mercurial compounds and understood some of the properties of alcohol his knowledge of poisons was extensive the principal works of arnaldus are rosarius philosophorum flos florum antidotarum de venis and de venenis raymundus lullius twelve thirty five to thirteen fifteen was descended from an old and noble catalonian family and led a varied career according to weight in his lives of the alchemistical philosophers he united the saint and the man of science the philosopher and the preacher the apostle and the itinerant lecturer the delectician and the martyr in his youth he was a courtier and a man of pleasure in mature age he was an ascetic who had discovered the universal science through a special revelation from god after his death he was denounced as a heretic and then narrowly escaped beatification as a saint he was probably initiated into the secrets of alchemy by bacon and arnaldus in all about five hundred works have been ascribed to raymundus but there is very great uncertainty whether he is identical with a grammarian and dialectician of the same name and moreover the errant life which he led could have afforded him few opportunities for the investigations involved in the search for the magnum opus therefore it is supposed that many of his writings are spurious although three of his alchemical writings the testamentum codicillus seu vada mecum and experimenta are regarded as genuine his alchemistic doctrines are obscure and mystical and this led many to think that wonderful facts were concealed in his treatises raymundus attributed remarkable powers to the philosopher's stone for he was able to say if the sea were of mercury i would change it into gold he also affirmed that health long life and precious stones were to be procured through its means the alchemist styling himself raymundus lullius was acquainted with nitric acid and used it to dissolve certain metals and he prepared aqua regia by adding sal ammoniac or common salt to nitric acid and was aware of its dissolving gold grulin in his gestic de chemie states that lullius was acquainted with spirit of wine and that he prepared vegetable tinctures by its use an alum from rocha white and red mercurial precipitates cupellate silver 
marcasite and oil of rosemary are mentioned in the works of alchemy attributed to him among the other alchemists of this period were jean de Meung, the monk ferrarius and pope john the twenty second the latter is claimed as an adept by alchemists but his orthodox biographers denied that he had any alchemistic inclinations at his death in thirteen thirty four he left in his coffers eighteen million florins in gold and seven millions in jewels and the alchemists attribute these treasures to his skill in their science in the fourteenth and first half of the fifteenth centuries many alchemists were supposed to be in possession of the philosopher's stone the prominent alchemists of this period were nicholas flemmel peter bono Johannes de rupecissa isaac of holland and his son bernard trevison john fontaine sir george ripley thomas dalton and thomas norton owing to the fact that alchemy was encouraged at many of the european courts at this time many charlatans sprang up pretending to be able to make gold without limit and in some cases the frauds attempted were discovered nevertheless alchemy was not suppressed and it found a special protection at the court of henry the sixth of england notwithstanding the fact that in fourteen o four by an act of parliament it was forbidden to make gold or silver as the preceding monarchs had had to pay heavily for their encouragement of the art as early as thirteen forty four edward the third had coins struck from gold said to have been made in the tower and later large quantities of counterfeit gold coins were manufactured the alchemist le cour seduced charles the seventh of france into a similar experiment during a war with england which only resulted in increasing the national debt this counterfeiting caused much discredit to be attached to alchemy and the result was that this was extended to chemistry itself however the knowledge of chemical compounds and operations was enriched during this period by some valuable experimental observations and toward the beginning of the sixteenth century chemical knowledge was greatly extended end of section three